Welcome to all SITINET member cities, uh, partners, and other participants from across Asia uh, interested in increasing urban resilience in, uh, in their cities. Uh, it is honestly a pleasure uh, and with great honor that we SITINET are organizing today this series of webinar on urban resilience practices from Northeast Asian cities. My name is Kevin Drouin, Program Officer here at SITINET, and I will be your moderator for today's back-to-back -back session, which will focus on two main topics in relation with urban resilience uh, practices from Northeast Asian cities. Before we jump in further into our main content, uh, I would like to acknowledge and sincerely thank uh, two, our two main partners for this uh, series, without whom it would have not been possible to complete this series. First of all, there is uh, WRI China, so the World Resource Institute. Uh, it is a global research organization that spans more than 50 countries. It is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, however, in 2008, WRI opened its first international office in Beijing, China. So it has supported China's national strategy on environmental protection and sustainable development in major areas, including uh, synergetic control and prevention of uh, air pollution, and coordinated management of water quality, uh, water resources, green finances, and capacity building of uh, environmental governance. Our other main partner for this series is uh, RQ City. So Beijing RQ City Consulting uh, is a Chinese domicile uh, multinational professional consultation firm that is uh, was founded in 1999. Since the establishment, the firm has been dedicated in promoting the process of globalization of urban development in China and has provided cutting edge solution and strategy, consulting, exhibition, urban planning practices with approximately 1,200 professional globally. So RQ City is now one of the largest intercity network in China uh, by globalization and professionalism. Uh, moving forward, uh, I know we have a lot of participants actually that uh, a lot of them are member cities. Uh, I'm sorry for a little bit of a sounds coming from outside as you know <laughs> right in the middle of the city but I would like to introduce for uh, participants today that are not familiar with CityNet a little bit about more of who we are. Uh, so we are a, the largest association of urban stakeholders committed to sustainable development with the goal to connect uh, urban actors and deliver tangible solution for cities especially with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. So we were actually established in 1987 and uh, so we have a long history and it was founded and established by UNDP, uh, UN Habitat, and UNSCAP. And uh, today we span over uh, over 170 members, from which 110 are cities, all coming from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we have a multitude of services and, and that we can provide to you if you become a member. Uh, the first one I would like to highlight is the Urban SDG Knowledge Platform. It is a project that we have in uh, collaboration with the Seoul Metropolitan Government, UNSCAP, and CityNet. Uh, and I'd like to just quickly go a little bit deeper. So what the, U, the Urban SDG Knowledge Platform is, uh, it is a platform where government uh, officials from cities go online and they can upload themselves their best practices and cases of implementation of the SDGs. And currently the platform has over 300 cases. So I really invite uh, city official to, to take a, uh, a look at it and you can also share your own best practices where you get to learn from other um, other cities as well. Some of the other uh, services that we can provide to you are uh, different workshops. Uh, we can also be a training partner. Uh, we have as well training um, varieties of workshop on, and thematics that we can help you with. This is an example of one of the workshops that uh, may be a more typical workshop that we host. Uh, on a non-COVID time, it would have been, uh, it's usually hosted in person, let's say in Seoul or in different member cities from CityNet. Uh, this one was on smart cities. Uh, but we also, since the beginning of the pandemic, carry out a lot of, of workshop webinars and, and trainings or technical assistance online, uh, as this series is part of. I would now like to get towards uh, the objective of this session for today. Uh, so what we want to do with, with this series of webinars is actually to increase the capacity of you local governments uh, from Asia Pacific on urban resilience. And we want to go through cross-cutting cross themes. Of course, it, it is a, a wide topic, so that includes disaster preparedness, emergency management, disaster relief, long-term uh, post-disaster recovery. 
Uh, we also want to exchange new theoretical concept about the global solution, but really what we want to is, is to get those best practices coming from cities located in Northeast Asia. And by this, the focus uh, today and in the previous sessions were related to, to China, Japan, and Korea. But we're glad to see that there's also uh, multiple participants that are coming from uh, beyond this region. We also want to build consensus toward understanding the current framework of urban resilience uh, for cities in Asia Pacific. We actually have a quite uh, busy schedule for today as we're hosting a back-to-back -back session. So this is session two of this series. So we had uh, session one hosted on, on Tuesday uh, where we had a um, various presentation related from uh, practices coming from China. And today, the first so session two, the first one of the day is gonna be related most likely to the evaluation framework for urban resilience. So we're gonna be having two presentation on first COVID-19 action and evaluation framework for Asia Pacific cities. And secondly, uh, about city resilience uh, evaluation through an SDG localization lenses. We will then take a short break uh, and multiple other participant is gonna be joining us for session three. Uh, which is going to be with presentation of best practices coming directly from Chongqing City, Talian, Suwon, and Matsuyama City. Now moving forward, uh, it is a my honor and definitely a pleasure to introduce for a keynote speech uh, Mr. Sanjay Abatia, which is the head of the uh, Office for Northeast Asia, uh, ONEA, and, and uh, Global Education and Training Institute, Getsi for Disaster Risk Reduction in Incheon. A Republic based in Republic of Korea, where over the past two years he has guided, uh, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, he ended training for over 6,000 government officials, but I am pretty sure that by now they have been quite active uh, online, so I, I would assume if I'm correct that this number might have even doubled, if not tripled, so the reach has really increased. It is really a pleasure to have him today, uh, and given his experience and uh, I think this is most relevant for a session today. So I would really like to invite you, Mr. Sanjay Abatia, to give us a short uh, keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, Kevin. And uh, welcome to all the delegates and participants uh, and members of the CityNet. This is uh, really an honor and a privilege to be able to uh, address you uh, on, uh, on urban resilience practices uh, uh, session for Northeast uh, Asia uh, and, and provide the keynote speech. So uh, let me start by just giving a quick introduction. UNDRR is the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction uh, and it is um, based in Geneva with the regional offices around the world. In Incheon in South Korea, we have the Office for Northeast Asia, and also we have the Global Education and Training Institute. Uh, this training institute is, is the one which provides the, uh, the training opportunities, uh, focusing on civil servants and particularly focusing on local governments. So we are also the hub for what is known as the Making Cities Resilient Campaign. I'll talk about that in a while. Uh, and <clears throat> new programs on uh, urban resilience. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, um, as you all know, COVID-19 has taken a terrible toll on, um, and, and, uh, on lives, uh, on livelihoods, uh, and the uh, socioeconomic fabric of, of, the, of the global uh, scenario. And, uh, about uh, it is estimated that about 95% of the uh, coronavirus infections are in cities so it is the cities which uh, which are at the front line of tackling uh, the covid situation but apart from the covid situation we also have the other disasters happening so we have cascading emergencies so we have the pandemic of course but apart from with that, we have the we, we have had uh, floods, we have fires, uh, we have had earthquakes, we have had hurricanes and cyclones, we, and that that is still continuing. So the 
the scenario has bec is becoming much more complex than it used to be. <clears throat> and if you, um, uh, the, just uh, yesterday, the Secretary General of the United Nations has also mentioned that the frequency and the intensity of climate related emergencies is also increasing. And uh, this is becoming a new normal. So cities are now faced with, with much, much more challenges than they were in the past. And the situation is only going to get more complex as we go ahead. At the same time, there are what we call the underlying drivers of risk. So these are basically um, issues such as access to health, access to livelihoods, access to microfinance, access to um, education, access to immunization programs. So all of these, you don't think that these might be related to disasters, but they enhance the impact of any disaster. So if there is uh, a flood happening in a city where people do not have e uh, uh, good access to health systems, then uh, not only will the, uh, the flood cause the damage that it causes, but it will also seriously impact the health uh, situation of the most vulnerable people. So the two will interact and make the situation even worse than before. The World Bank is estimating that this year there will be about 150, 15, 115 million new people coming into extreme poverty around the world. This is the first time since World War II that this has happened. Throughout, since all these decades, we have been able to reduce poverty. But this time, it is uh, going to increase by the end of this year. So it will take years to come back to the, the normal that we had before. <clears throat> so under these circumstances, uh, what is most important is that cities should avail of all the opportunities they have to share their experiences, but also to take support from uh, partners uh, around the world who can help them to uh, increase urban resilience. As Kevin just uh, introduced, CityNet is, is one of those uh, solutions. And I was very happy to see uh, that in CityNet, there are many cities who are also a member of another global campaign called the Making Cities Resilient Campaign. This campaign has been running from 2010 to 2020, and it focused on convincing mayors and the, and the political leadership of cities that they need to look at disaster risk reduction in a holistic manner to understand that it is an investment in the future. It is not a cost. And uh, today, when we are in the midst of the COVID crisis, we, we can understand how real this message is. We have seen uh, over the years that though Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which is the framework, the global framework for reducing disaster risk, which was negotiated and agreed to by all member states, uh, all the countries of the world. That mentioned in 2015, it mentioned that health emergencies should be part of the risk planning of any national or local government. And yet, uh, and we had uh, a few warning signals, Zika, uh, MERS, Ebola, SARS, all of these, uh, and yet, when the year to 2020 started, we saw that uh, this had slipped through the cracks and uh, there was no coordinated planning with the health department on how to deal with risk. So keeping that in mind, um, we, we need to learn from this experience and make sure that this does not happen again. At least we should not be caught unawares. We should... Uh, document all the lessons that the cities have had from uh, dealing with the COVID situation. Secondly, we should share our lessons 
And uh, I, I'm happy to note that, especially in the Northeast Asia, there has been a lot of sharing of these lessons. We have organized webinars, so have many other partners, uh, allowing uh, cities from the Northeast Asian region to talk about their experiences, not only within the region or the sub-region, but also with the global audience, because this is very important. How, how, uh, how cities have dealt with these challenges so that they can learn from each other. The Making Cities Resilient campaign has more than 4,300 cities signed up. So, uh, but uh, it ends this year. Uh, so we uh, are looking with our partners and with, this, with cities around the world, uh, is there something else to be done? Well, this year, of course, proves that uh, cities still do not have the full capacity to assess their urban resilience and to determine the actions that they need to take to enhance this resilience. So with that in mind, uh, a new initiative, the MCR 2030, and I've shared the link in the chat already with you, so please feel free to go onto that website and explore. MCR 2030 or Making Cities Resilient 2030 has, was launched in October. It will be operational from January and it will run the full course of 10 years along with the Sendai framework, the new urban agenda, the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals. So we hope uh, that uh, this uh, new initiative will be able to provide the support that cities need. It will focus more on implementation, so not just the advocacy, trying to bring in more cities, <clears throat> but also to uh, help and support cities to achieve, firstly, to do the, uh, to create the awareness within the city so that they can have all, all members on board, not only the city council and the civil servants of the city, but also the, the citizens. So everyone can understand that reducing the risks is uh, a development activity. It is not the activity of the civil defense. It is not the activity of the emergency department. It's the activity of all. It, uh, it needs a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. And uh, only then can you actually achieve the reduction of risk. And it is an investment, as I already mentioned, not a cost. So once everyone is on board with that, then the second stage is to do the diagnostics. And there are a large number of tools available. Uh, UNDRR has, um, under the Making Cities Resilient campaign, uh, promoted a very easy to use tool called the Disaster Resilience Scorecard for Cities. And I know many members of, of CityNet have already used that scorecard. So what the scorecard does is help you unpack what the Sendai framework is saying so that you can understand all the dimensions of, of risk through easy, easy questions. And as you answer the questions, you understand what is required, what you have, what you don't have, what are the gaps. And then based on the gaps, you can develop the actions you need to take and then move forward to bankable projects so that those actions can be completed. So the second stage is the diagnostics. The third stage is having these actions planned out. So having some kind of a plan or a strategy, which is uh, integrated with the city's development plan, and then implementing that uh, plan or strategy. So ultimate objective being having uh, getting risk-informed sustainable development, which directly contributes uh, not only to SDG 11b, but to all the SDGs, right from uh, reducing poverty to, to enhancing education, health, and so on. So it covers everything. Um, in the MCR 2030, we are also trying to bring in non-traditional partners. So uh, cities uh, reached out to us and said that it, it, it sometimes becomes difficult to engage with partners who could help them. So in a, in a city's jurisdiction, there are universities who can help, who have uh, immense research uh, capacity. 
they have technical assistance capacity there are uh, private sector companies which have a lot of technical assistance capacity um, there are research organizations there are consultancies uh, who can help with uh, urban land use planning building codes engineering consultancies uh, and there are finance municipal finance um, experts, bond issuers, credit raters, all kinds of partners exist uh, within a city or uh, globally who, who, who can help cities. The, the thing is that the cities need to be able to identify who they are and then see how they fit in with their role. So all that, of course, comes from the diagnostics. So once you do the diagnostics, then you know what what uh, you need to do, what are the gaps and how to address those. When we are looking at the COVID situation, so there is also uh, a very good uh, tool known as the public health scorecard. And again, I know some cities of the city net have also already done this uh, and, and practiced this. This was available since 2018. Uh, so again, shows uh, how health slip through the cracks and that's why we have been taken by surprise this year uh, this also again in the same way as a scorecard it helps you to diagnose uh, how resilient your health system is by asking some simple questions and uh, helps you to identify the gaps in that health system and then uh, can get you towards the actions uh, which you need to take to to fill in these gaps or to address these challenges. So, so these all these tools are available. In the MCR 2030, we also plan to bring in all the other tools. So UN Habitat, uh, World Bank, um, ECLE, UCLG, uh, all of them are, are core partners uh, of, of this initiative and they will be bringing their tools also and offering. Because we also understand that cities are at different levels of capacity and different tools are relevant at different times. So we have the simple tools uh, like the scorecard, which I already mentioned, which is available in, in more than 16 languages now, including Chinese and Korean. So that would be of interest to the Northeast Asian cities. And similarly, the health scorecard is also available in Chinese and Korean. Uh, so, but, but there are uh, more complex tools also from UN Habitat, from World Bank, city profiling tool, city risk profiling tool, and so on. So all of this will be available under one umbrella. So that is easier for, for cities to understand what will suit them uh, and, uh, and, and to maybe try out different tools at different phases of, of their journey in resilience. And uh, lastly, before I end, we are also uh, promoting, uh, we have been promoting under the Making Cities Resilient campaign, and I know CityNet has also been promoting city-to-city -city exchanges. This is a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, of course, this year it has been uh, impossible for the travel to happen, for uh, to have an in, in-person city-to-city exchange, but through webinars, uh, through uh, online um, lecture series like this one uh, and um, and these other virtual means it has i think this year we have crossed a kind of a threshold because i i personally feel that more city to city exchange has happened this year than ever before and that is because there have been so many opportunities and uh, seminars and webinars online, which have actually increased access because instead of having to travel uh, and, and all the, and the uh, not only the finances involved for travel, but also all the logistics involved for travel, uh, city officials can join from where they are. They are able to uh, uh, attend uh, these events. There are in, online interpretation available. So, uh, so this has become a very powerful tool. And I think for the future, this will be something that we need to continue. So this is a, a positive learning from this very unfortunate year that we have found another way of reaching out and reaching out to, to larger numbers and uh, uh, to in, encourage 
cities to exchange their uh, experiences, uh, lessons learned, and the best practices, and to be able to <clears throat> learn from each other. So in a way, geography has become history. So with those words, uh, I leave you, and uh, I want to thank you again for this opportunity. And uh, I also uh, wish you all the best. And I, I think this is, uh, this is a very good uh, concept. And uh, we hope to, uh, you know, look, take, do some more collaboration in the future also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vasya. It is really a pleasure to hear you. And uh, we know how much UNDR in your office, especially, has been continuously doing tremendous work for capacity building on, uh, on DR. But I think especially what is most impressive for us is how you, uh, as, a, as a UN office, have put so much emphasis as well on working with cities. Uh, and I think, of course, as being an association of cities is something that we're especially uh, looking forward to. And I invite all participants as well to look uh, into the MCR 2030 that was mentioned. You can look in the chat box as well uh, for this new initiative. And also, it's interesting that you mentioned the Sendai framework and, of course, the, uh, the health card, the scorecard as well for cities for, for DR. Uh, this is the kind of things we're going to be talking about in the next two presentations as well, as those are, I think, uh, the one that your office has, has made are, are quite uh, up there in, in terms of, of best practices and, and best way to analyze and create this framework for uh, cities to know about their uh, DR implementation and capacities. So thank you very much once again. We are now getting to the uh, main part of session two and our next uh, speaker uh, today is, is going to be Dr. Tony Michel, uh, who is going to be presenting on COVID-19 uh, experience survey uh, as part of this analysis and framework for uh, you and uh, for D, for DR analysis. So currently, Dr. Tony Michel is a uh, region is a is a regional and urban economist who has written about urban transport and work with Korean planners and international consultant on a series of uh, World Bank, UNDP, Ministry of Transport and Ministry of Construction Project in Asia. He is currently the president of KABC. Uh, and Dr. Michel came to Korea as an economic advisor to the Korean government in 1978. He worked for various international and Korean government agencies before setting up this private practices uh, in which he advised multinational and undertakes research on different aspects of the Korean economy for a broad range of uh, clients. So Dr. Michel, let, let us now hear about your presentation. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, let me go uh, briefly through the summary of where we are in the survey. Uh, it is an interim report, so it only gives you a taste of what we have been uh, studying. Um, project began in June 2020 with the following aims, to track the coronavirus experience in each city within the membership to assess the value of the existing UNDR uh, Sendai protocol, which we've just been hearing about, under the stress of a pandemic, as opposed to other forms of disaster, and to look at what worked best in which city in terms of crisis organization, containment of the epidemic, relief of citizens, NGO experience, ICT, and of course, resilience in general. So an epidemic, uh, as you will have gathered from Mr. Batia's uh, uh, <clears throat> analysis, is unlike an earthquake, flood, tsunami, forest fire, nuclear contamination, or any of the disasters in the original Sendai Protocol. Especially, it does not destroy property, only lives and livelihoods. Generally, the whole country is affected in a pandemic, so risk reduction can be national rather than a local responsibility. But in practice, as the pandemic uh, spreads, <coughs> individual cities may be epicenters and national systems overwhelmed or too far away for practical help. Uh, techniques evolved in support of uh, UNDRR uh, have uh, relevance but so the newer IT and other techniques that we were looking for. <coughs> <coughs> mm. 
Now, the project was conceived during the calm of May and June in Korea, when we'd been through one peak of epidemic, and it was assumed that was the end of it. It would just gradually go away. It didn't, of course, as it didn't do in any other country. It came back to the second wave and even a third wave. And um, so the respondents to our survey had to change many of the things that they were saying. And uh, we are still learning, of course. Um, so in, in the questionnaire, the instrument, we drew heavily on the UNDRR questionnaires, the two mentioned, the original one and the health one. And respondents would recognize the questions from their somewhat lengthy wording. Um, and we also brought in some from the UN e-government survey 2018. Uh, the survey period has been approximately October to December the 15th, so we're still collecting. And uh, in addition, there have been individual interviews of cities, which I found extremely valuable, and I want to talk about one of the lessons I learned from that. We'll be compiling the full analysis and report during December, and then it will become available from CityNet once finished. So we covered six areas. You can see them here on the screen. I won't read them. Um, <clears throat> and you can also see one of the questionnaire questions that was drawn from UNDR. Uh, what we, however, did was to take this basic question and we asked the same question. What was the situation before the epidemic, during the epidemic, and to the degree, degree that we were after the epidemic? Um, after the epidemic. Um, and uh, 12 cities to date have uh, replied with a long questionnaire. Uh, we're in the process of doing 10 interviews and we have simplified the questionnaire for cities that complain. They just, the respondents just didn't have the kind of data that we were asking for and that was sent out um, this week and we hope to get back about 20 uh, by uh, December the 15th. So let me give you a brief summary of where we are. Um, the final report is gonna have a one page city summary of key characteristics. It will have comparative data between the cities. We are trying to create a COVID index in those six centers, uh, sectors that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at the degrees to which the city adapted its organization during the pandemic and the degree to which the UNDRR um, organization helped. Um, and uh, we're looking for areas of workshop activity which CityNet could become involved in organizing uh, to help its members in the future. So, uh, as you will all have witnessed, because you have all lived through it, the crisis has been a very rapid learning experience and a time to question many of the ways we live in cities and what we expect. Um, so, okay. Um, after the uh, disaster of 2011. Why am I getting myself twice? Okay. Um, so, uh, as you heard, and it was wonderful to have Mr. Batia as the uh, start of this process to introduce the whole process. I don't need to go back over it again. Um, but as he said, despite all the training that had been given to so many cities, the world was not ready for this kind of pandemic, which required different skills uh, and different organization. So let me quickly go through um, the six sectors. First of all, urban demographic and economic profile. Basically, each city has its own COVID story. No two cities, even in Metro Manila, which is divided into a number of uh, 
municipalities. The story is not exactly the same. Uh, the results that we have now range from the uh, city of Gao in uh, Sri Lanka to Jakarta. So from very small to very big. We have low infection cities like Taipei, China, Ho Chi Minh, and high infection cities like Jakarta and Metro Manila. Um, in most cities, the leadership and decision maker was the mayor or vice mayor, or sometimes the governor of the province. And maybe I should say now that one of the things that we don't ask about in the UNDRR protocol is leadership. And it's very clear in interviewing cities that the degree that the mayor, the vice mayor, the governor, some other figure could show leadership and get together an organization which could really handle this emerging and unexpected epidemic was remarkable. And so I think one of the things we ought to talk about more in the future is urban leadership. Um, so handling lockdown was unique in each city how to seal off the city uh, so infection did not come in from outside, um, made life simpler if it was done, and it was against WHO advice to do this, remember. Um, of course, if you're on an island, that's even easier. And um, stopping air travel uh, with all its consequences for tourism made a major impact in many years. Uh, many countries, and many cities. So on the left here, you see a, a CityNet uh, survey done in 2018. Uh, this is from Makati, part of Manila. Um, and it lists the various factors that were um, designed to measure disaster resilience. We will have in the final, on the other side, uh, our own uh, our own structure for this profile in which, as I said, we were trying to give an index for each of the six, uh, six areas. What I would also mention is that the frequency of typhoons in the Philippines meant that the exercises that have been done on behalf of uh, UNDRR designed for typhoons also provided excellent uh, structure for dealing with the livelihood part of the, uh, of the pandemic. And I think that from the interviews I've made so far, the, um, the Filipinos have been better at creating social cohesion and relieving distress um, of any of the cities I've interviewed to date, but I haven't interviewed enough to be sure about that. So what, what do our uh, survey show? On the left, the number is the number of cities responding. And we see how before the pandemic, uh, people were rating their city that they had authority and power, but they didn't know how to handle interagency. Um, during the epidemic, uh, one city felt that it had uh, greatly improved. And then that same city, by the end of the main epidemic, the first epidemic, uh, had improved into the third or highest category. So when we look at all cities, they went through this rapid learning, rapid reorganization um, if they were successful. Um, in the COVID experience, um, larger cities in most countries were usually most severely hit. Uh, some smaller cities could limit infections by sealing themselves off. Um, at the bottom, you see the governor of uh, uh, Jakarta who contracted uh, coronavirus December the 1st, or was diagnosed at that point. Across all the interviews, we saw mayors who had died, who had lost their family. It is a real crisis in terms of personality at all levels of society. Um, here's uh, this measure again with a uh, uh, UN style question about uh, the extent to which communities understand are able to fulfill their roles in public health and well-being before, during and after the main pandemic. So in each case we're looking at before, during and uh, where we are now which is obviously not after the final pandemic but after. 
um, eight or nine months of uh, pandemic. Uh, this is an interesting question that to what extent the community's mental health needs addressed. I think it's suddenly becoming uh, apparent that uh, mental health for ordinary people, everybody, whether they have disease or not, are affected. Uh, a photograph went uh, worldwide of a doctor comforting an old man in ICU uh, in America who was crying because he couldn't get out. It's a real tragedy. And in one city, we found that by chance, the vice mayor was a psychologist. Uh, and therefore, in that one city, they had created a structure for mental health and welfare, which surpassed that one small Indonesian city, um, anything else that I've met. So there are these examples where thinking about the future thinking about the conditions uh, have uh, made remarkable effects. Obviously, we look at the health impact. Um, daily on TV, you see this. Uh, and we look particularly at the number of ICU beds. Here's a, a temporary hospital in uh, Hong Kong, made with the assistance of the mainland China, um, ready for this massive overload. And one of the things that we wanted to see was this question, to what extent are hospitals and emergency care centers able to manage with a sudden influx? And um, it, on these scales, um, you can see the degree to which there was an improvement during the uh, epidemic. Um, this is um, the question of enforcement and lockdown and quarantine as to who was responsible within the city for a particular uh, enforcing the lockdown, whether it's community action, local officials, police, military, others, uh, and month by month, it gives you some idea of the granularity of what we are trying to look at in the long questionnaire. Um, contact tracing obviously is very important. And you see how in the early stages, nobody was really thinking about contact tracing, but how advanced it was um, later in the process. Come to social and economic impact. Uh, and um, obviously the first thing was about uh, saving lives. Second, it was saving livelihood. And cities varied immensely more in this aspect than in any other. Uh, because we have national, provincial, citywide, local actions that were important. I'd expected NGOs to be reported as playing a larger role than they were, and I had, been unex I had not expected that businesses working with the city have worked so well. I think this is another area that we haven't looked in enough. And local sub-communities also played an important role. So successful operations were best conducted in business city cooperation. And again, I find some of the Filipino cities outstanding in the way that they have imaginatively handled and solved all kinds of problems. Um, so here's a, a survey on month by month, who was actually active in uh, uh, giving emergency relief. Um, there's some details for uh, surveys that uh, people filled in where questions weren't enough. So we come to resilience and the last one will be ICT. Um, and this is the theme of uh, this uh, two-day conference. And uh, we looked at resilience over four sectors, economic activity, social activity, healthcare, uh, and relief of the deprived. These are the uh, 150 million new people in poverty that um, UN Secretary General talked about. Um, apart from cities which have been very really likely affected, most cities expected it would take a long time to get back um, to normal. First, economic activity and some social activity, but healthcare is going to take longer. This, you might think this is surprising because, in one way, the pandemic is all about healthcare but people realize that their healthcare system is going to take longer to get back to where it should be. 
and relief of the deprived is um, scattered, um, but uh, not that effective, perhaps. Um, so, is there a strategy and process to reboot uh, differences between cities, as you see, but now, after the pandemic, um, seven cities out of the 12 feel that they are on top of this, which is good to hear. Um, final one was communication and ICT ability. One of the questions we asked was what percentage of citizens have mobile phones? So, and, and universally it was high. So it was something of a surprise for those of us who work mainly in Korea to find it was local radio, which was the main form of communication and, and to a good degree local TV. Because in Korea, we had this very advanced uh, system uh, set out originally for extreme weather or invasion from the north, but adapted perfectly to give uh, local information depending on which ward of the city or group it's called, um, you got different information. So here you can see that uh, eight of the 12 cities put local radio and TV uh, at the top, so about 66%, and that the others were, were used uh, broadly. Um, so we asked questions about priorities that could be developed through CityNet, um, uh, and these are some of the answers. So one of the issues is prevention drills and how to conduct drills in our flying workshop. There's this desire to get back to offline, because as you're aware, Offline, there are all the other interactions in a, in a meeting which take place between the main speakers and which often are so valuable. So we are expecting about 20 more responses to our simplified questionnaire, uh, five more interviews with cities. Uh, we would like more Chinese cities um, that in fact, I think no Chinese cities are members who will supply but if there are any volunteers please write in the chat and we'll send you the questionnaire straight away um, and so what cities interviews say is we would like to just get down and talk about our experience in a group of cities of comparable size so small cities with small cities bigger cities with bigger cities and so on we want to know about best practice in the different categories uh, including things like mental health. And we want to know about prevention drills and simulations. So that completes uh, a brief outline of the report. The final report will be available online sometime early in the next year, in uh, new year. Thank you very much for listening and thanks to all the cities who filled our questionnaire or who are going to in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony Michel. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, for a really insightful presentation for those that are non CityNet members or, or maybe system members that have not completed the survey just for your information. Uh, we're carrying out this project and the survey to actually get to understand, to have a snapshot of our members' needs and in, in terms of uh, related to COVID-19 and their current situation and to better prepare and customize our activities uh, to better serve you. And so I, I think I'd like to add the, the quick uh, clarification that Mr. Sanjaya Vasya has uh, put in the chat, and I think it is quite relevant. Uh, of course, the survey that we've done is, is not solely based on, on the UNDR uh, scorecards and, and the Sendai framework. It is just one of the way we evaluate. And so Mr. Batsia has wanted to clarify that the Sendai framework uh, advocate for a multi-hazard approach aiming to reduce systemic risk uh, with governance as an underpinning principle. So thank you very much for your precision and please keep looking in the chat as well. Uh, there's some interesting link that you might want uh, to go for. Regarding uh, the actual survey, I think what has been uh, quite impressive for us and most interesting uh, was to see how some of the cities that all, I mean, it's an experience that we all went through, but to, to get through this kind of like rapid learning experience, I, I think was, uh, was something that we were surprised at uh, how fast some of the cities managed to turn around really their system and, and, and we, we tried to uh, 
com complement this approach uh, moving forward. Uh, given the time schedule, we will just take one question that has been asked uh, from the audience, uh, which is related to um, if there was any reference or material to the indicator uh, that we've used. I, I think maybe Dr. Michel might want to emphasize a little bit on this, but I think mostly the, the survey was based both on the UNDRR um, addendum on the help card and as well on the disaster risk uh, scorecard as well and moreover on the UN uh, ICT annual um, survey but if, if Dr. Michel if you have other sources of indicator and, and uh, material that you <coughs> use for the end to, to prepare the survey please let us know. Uh, not so much to prepare but to analyze the results we're trying to compile from the, the data we've collected our own index of uh, effectiveness in the six areas that we've been studying. So um, I can't, this is a, a the process is still in, in, in process, but um, if you uh, leave me an email address, I can write and tell you about it as soon as we've c conducted the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony Michel. So this is it for our first presentation of this session today. We will be moving forward to the second one. Uh, where we will be highlighting a city resilience evaluation and analysis uh, framework through an SDG localization lens. And to do so, I would like to invite Dr. Yoon Semi. Uh, Dr. Yoon is an assistant professor at, of sustainable development and cooperation at the Underwood International College of Yonsei University. Uh, she received her bachelor and doctoral uh, degree in the field of economics and sustainable development. Uh, respectively from Columbia University and on the city of uh, Columbia University in the city of New York. So her research interests like primarily, uh, we're sorry about the PPT, there you go. So her research interests like primarily at the nexus of development and environment to enhance the livelihood of the poor. So she's also interested in innovative solution to simultaneously alleviate poverty and pursue environmental sustainability. So I would now like to invite Dr. Yun Simi, you may present, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Is it okay if I share slides or will you be? No, please go ahead, you can share your, your screen, yes. All right, good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Honorable guests of the city that Oops, sorry, I don't know why. Let me restart that. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Yoon, Assistant Professor of Sustainable Development at Yonsei University, as Kevin mentioned. It's my honor to address our ongoing research collaboration with CityNet to contribute to acceleration of SDG action among city stakeholders. So to give a little bit of background, speaking to an audience of practitioners that are interested in sustainable development is always an exciting opportunity for me, since this is exactly what I saw as I pursued my doctoral degree in sustainable development at Columbia University. Living in Morningside Heights, a neighborhood on the west side of Upper Manhattan in New York City, near the end of Central Park for 10 years, I personally witnessed the importance of integrating measures on social inclusion and, and environmental sustainability, not just on economic development. So this led me to focus on measuring the impact of social enterprises which may help to find solutions to hard to solve problems or wicked problems such as climate change, gender inequality, quality education, which could be applicable in context of both developing countries and developed countries. And in this process, I also witnessed the importance of collecting data that, measures, that matters to measure progress since impact evaluation cannot be done without reliable data. If we try to tra travel back in time to 2012, where we had the Rio Plus 20 Summit, this was actually the time when 
we as a global community agreed upon the aim of sustainable development. When, whenever I ask my students or any, any practitioner that is interested in sustainable development, we tend to lose sight of what we agreed as the aim for sustainable development. In this document that was signed by all the member states in 2012, we decided that we want to achieve sustainable development by promoting sustained, inclusive, and equitable economic growth, creating greater opportunities for all, reducing inequalities, raising basic standards of living, fostering equitable social development and inclusion, and promoting the in integrated and sustainable management of natural resources and ecosystems that supports inter alia economic, social, and human development while facilitating ecosystem conservation, regeneration, and restoration and resilience in the face of new and emerging challenges. So one of the shortcomings of this document and this discussion was that much of the emphasis was placed on the national policies and priorities, even though we know that as SDGs would be more, much more actionable, concise, and easy to communicate if we were able to make SDG targets to be more city-specific. Since the complexity of interactions between human and natural systems may be much more easy to share if, since cities tend to sh share problems across different contexts. And for me, as a researcher and a scholar, since to, it, is, it has been an interesting fact to note that since 2008, we have crossed the 50% mark in terms of the proportion of global population living in urban areas. And by 2018, we already had 55% of these people living in urban settings, and by 2050, it's expected that the number will reach 6.5 billion. So it is, would be essential that we learn how cities can be economically productive, socially inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. So in other words, as we expect a greater share of urban population to live in, in these areas, but across Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and Caribbean, and Northern America, it'll be crucial to think about how effectively a city can plan and prepare for the future prospects of its sustainable development. So in order for us to think about these prospects, we would have to hone in on the specific challenges the cities are facing right now. We already know that urban sustainability is an enormous task. Cities need to be places where individuals can find decent and productive work and businesses for, to produce and trade efficiently so that you can meet these residents' desire to grow by, pro, by providing them with reliable and resilient infrastructure. Such infrastructure may have to be introduced for the first time in certain cities of developing countries while cities in developed countries will have to retrofit failing urban infrastructure. Cities can also be places that create high social mobility, decreasing the divide between the rich and the poor. But the social, st social stability, trust, and harmony in society will be affected by the extent of social mobility that cities can provide. So by definition, Cities are places of high population density. So consequently, cities are highly vulnerable to environmental degradation, such as pollution of air and water, the rapid spread of communicable diseases, climate shocks, and other natural catastrophes. So consequently, cities will need to consider two types of environmental efforts. First, obviously mitigation, reducing the ecological footprint, but second, adaptation, so preparedness and resilience to changing environmental conditions. So in order for us to achieve such multifaceted development, some scholars have suggested that we consider six main transformation channels that could contribute to achieving multiple SDGs as a global community. 
One of these six transformations is indeed sustainable cities and communities. But other transformation channels include first, promoting education in a way that encourages gender equality and, lower, and lowering other types of inequalities. Another channel could be promoting key investments in health and well being, also by considering environmental health and healthy behaviors that reinforce positive outcomes. Another channel could be ensuring universal access to modern energy services and decarbonizing energy system so that we are able to reduce industrial pollution. Also, we would need to know how you're using available land to tackle issues of hunger, malnutrition and obesity, and environmental consequences of food systems. And last but not least, using artificial intelligence and other digital technologies to raise productivity, lowering production costs, reducing resource intensity of production processes, and using big data to make public services more readily available could be another transformation channel that we can think about as we, as we try to achieve SDGs in the city context. So depending on which track of population growth you expect your city to take, the medium growth, the high growth, or the low growth, the type of transformation channel that you may be able to pursue may also differ. So in order for cities to determine which transformation channel you can take, we would first have to acknowledge that there are important knowledge gaps that exist in designing these pathways for transformation. And in order for you to determine which pathway you want to take, then we need the date, we need to make sure that cities that are dedicated to pursuing SDGs are able to make some kind of decision based on a couple of action points for you to consider. So first, we will need integrated efforts of policy specialists, scientists, and engineers to assess where cities are now to achieve SDGs. So I saw in the previous presentation that extensive questionnaires were conducted to look at resilience of cities for COVID-19. So such type of collaboration would be the first step of determining what is the capacity level for designing transformations. Second would be for governments, businesses, and stakeholders to internalize and prioritize certain SDGs based on set already determined time-bound benchmarks. So this would be only possible if these stakeholders come together and decide on which SDGs to prioritize based on the capacity that you have right now. And then, what, and then you would have to determine what kind of partnerships you would need to promote and put forth in order to make those efforts. Third, transformation channels cannot be designed and imposed entirely from top down. So this is why discussions and consultation processes like the one provided by CityNet today will be, will be essential to improve the type of tools that are available to be implemented at the city level. And fourth, monitoring and evaluation of outcome data relevant to SDGs still remain inc incomplete. And there are even numerous indicators of sustainable development goals that do not have measurable points at the national level. So in order for us to go forward at the city level, we will have to decide on what type of indicators of SDGs will be relevant at the city context. This kind of finding was also a repeated point that was mentioned in the first Global Sustainable Development Report, which was released last year, September of last year. It was actually written by an independent group of scientists appointed by the United Nations Secretary General. It was comprised of about 15 experts that came from a variety of backgrounds, scientific disciplines, and institutions, also considering geographic balance and gender balance. And so in the first publication of a review of the sustainable development goals by all the UN member states, it was emphasized that we are not 
we have not sufficiently considered interconnectedness of SDGs. In particular, a main takeaway from this report was that we should, look, we should look beyond just looking at how we are doing in terms of each SDG, and instead we should rather focus on entry points that allow us to achieve multiple SDGs at the same time. And similar to the report that I showed you previously, it, which was published in the journal Nature, this report also highlighted that sustainable urban communities will be an important entry point to achieving SDGs simultaneously. So, but in order for us to consider such integrated approach, what, you, what we would need is sufficient coalitions to occur among stakeholders so that we have innovation, innovative partnerships emerging in, or, in order for us to measure progress on SDGs. And so this is why my colleagues at Yonsei University gladly took on the partnership proposed by CityNet to complement the current efforts taken by CityNet members to share best practices on implementing SDGs. Using our research capacity, what we tried to do was to streamline efforts and maximize synergies between sustainable development goals that can be taken on by cities. So the current official indicators by the UN Statistics Division and the voluntary national reviews are appropriate at the national level, but many of these indicators are irrelevant for the city context. But we, if we don't have enough information coming from city level data, it will be very difficult to streamline the type of partnerships that will be needed to tackle SDGs in the city context. And so understanding that SDGs are not legally binding, we still try to overcome this kind of lack of legislative risks by providing indicators that would be applicable for city context, especially not just for governments, but also for businesses and for citizens to consider so that you can try to communicate how cities are doing to multiple stakeholders in, in the area. So some of the sources that we have analyzed to complement the official statistics from the UN are the key performance indicators for smart sustainable cities developed by the United for Smart Sustainable Cities. We also considered the city prosperity index by the UN Habitat and OECD localized indicator framework for sustainable development goals. There are also a couple of indicators suggested by the voluntary local review by the European Union. So we also took that into consideration along with indicators suggested by the companies. So going through these indicators helped us to distinguish what are some of the indicators that can be used to measure multiple targets of SDGs at the same time, and also trying to transform national level indicators to be translated to the city context. And, so, and we also were able to parse out cross-cutting themes that emerged among indicators. And what we... of the existing city-specific SDG targets and indicators. And based on such evaluation, what we were able to achieve was to determine 10 main themes that emerged as pertinent to sustainable urban development. And these themes that came out were first poverty, hunger, hunger reduction, and food security. Second, second theme that emerged was on universal access to health, since a healthy population will be critical not just for economic development, but basic livelihoods of local residents. We also saw that education does come out as a major theme, since it's an enabler of sustainable development, contributing to not only poverty alleviation, but also inducing economic progress at both the local level and the national level. We also highlighted social inclusion as a theme of in itself, 
since disparities in income and livelihood opportunities may impede social cohesion and integration across city populations. We also saw that providing high quality basic services to urban residents remains to be a key challenge that cities want to tackle. And so water and sanitation is a goal, is a theme of it itself, along with energy, since it's a fuel for economic activities of cities. And then economy and, and jobs have been identified as a separate theme, theme where massive labor and resource and knowledge pool can be provided as cities. We also see that trans transportation is both an opportunity and an obstacle that cities need to tackle since poor transportation may impede sustainable urban development. And we categorize urban environment as a theme that integrates environmental sustainability aspects, not only considering greenhouse gas emissions and solid waste management, but how well you're able to integrate issues of ecosystem management and biodiversity loss. And last but not least, governance and finance is highlighted as a separate theme since effective governance and concrete financing strategies are essential to coordinate public resources and deploying policies and regulations to tackle urban challenges. So if any of the participants are interested in the type of questions that are included in this SDG Navigator for Cities, we would really welcome you to participate as well, because what we want to do in the medium run is based on the assessment that cities are able to do, we would like to match your answers to the best practices that are available are on the case study database of CityNet's Urban SDG Knowledge Platform. And based on the interests of the member, CityNet member, we would like to provide with you some of the ways that other cities have been, a, been trying to tackle certain SDGs within the entire SDG framework. So if you have any questions on what I just briefed you on, I would love to get your feedback or comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoon, uh, for this really insightful presentation. Um, I, I think Right from the start, what I would like to say that I was the most interested into is uh, really to think about this, the SDGs and the interconnectedness, how, how interconnected they are between them, and that maybe we should think about uh, focusing on some entry points that is really going to maximize our impact. And uh, by having just one action, we might be able to achieve multiple SDGs, right? And I think that relates really closely to what, as well, uh, Mr. Sanjaya Batsa was saying during the keynote speech where, and this is where we get into resilience as well for cities, uh, it is not a cost, right? I think cities have to, to see this really as an investment and how can we, uh, by taking some maybe smaller or minor action to increase the resilience of your city, you're gonna really be able to achieve uh, multiple of the goals that you set for, for development, for sustainability, and for resilience and for achieving the SDGs. As for the uh, SDG Navigator that you've introduced, this is a, a tool, a project that we sitting at are currently uh, carrying out with, with Yonsei and with Dr. Yoon. So if again, if some of the participants were interested, please feel free to send an email uh, at sdgplatform at citynet-ap.org. We'll put it in the chat. And uh, we were gonna be able to give your city a, a chance to be analyzed on your level of implementation of the SDG. So now I would like to see if there are some question uh, from the audience if there's anyone okay so we're doing good on, on this side uh, I, I think we will uh, given the time and we have a second session coming in we will close it now but before we move in again I'd like to tell the participant the audience really what we've talked about in this first session is we're giving you a series of really different tools analysis framework and how you can as a government official or local authorities see for your city how you're doing for resilience, right? Because this is a broad topic. It includes like a variety of different disaster. Nowadays with the pandemic, COVID, we're also talking about uh, how it's related to health as well. So really, I guess the list of, of different aspects that you can participate into are uh, that we've mentioned is the UNDRR um, 
Disaster Risk Reduction Scorecard. The HELP uh, Scorecard is well by UNDRR. Uh, we also are carrying out a survey uh, related to your capacity related to COVID-19 that we, if you're interested in having an analysis on how your, your city is doing that we can, you can take part into and that we will share with you. And lastly, we, uh, Dr. Yoon, we have talked about a uh, SDG navigator where we can do an analysis of your city's implementation of the SDGs. So before we close the session number two, uh, I would like to um, say a big thank you again to all of our speakers for this session. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Abbasia in the opening the keynote speech, Dr. Tony Michel and the first presentation, and Dr. Yoon Semi, of course, uh, that just spoke now. We will be taking a short five-minute break before the next session to give everyone the chance of uh, taking uh, a little, get our speakers from the next session ready and the, giving the interpreter as well a little chance to take a break. Uh, and uh, we will, you don't have to leave the session, just stay in and uh, in five minutes we will be resuming for our next session. You can expect at that point four presentations coming from different cities, uh, two cities from China, one from Japan and one from Korea that will be giving you uh, best practices in, in resilience. So really this is going to be the link with this session where we first gave you this framework, this analysis framework, and now the next session you will be getting a real case scenario and a bit more like concrete uh, example of how uh, you can imp imp improve and apply these, these techniques to improve resilience in your city. So we'll see you in about five minutes. Thank you very much.
So welcome back everyone to uh, this webinar series on res urban resilience from uh, Northeast Asian cities. We will now be starting session number three. Uh, thank you for all participants that are, have watched the first two sessions and for those just joining in now, uh, we welcome you. So my name is Kevin Doi. I will be uh, once again the moderator for this upcoming session. We're quite excited to have you now and for those of you that are uh, that didn't watch the session number two that we just finished. Uh, I'd like to once again thank uh, the, our two partners uh, without whom this session would not be, the series of webinars would not be possible. So WRI China as well as RQ City. Um, and we are CityNet here, so a network of cities based in Seoul, Korea. And we're quite excited to have a lot of participants today. Uh, this second session, this session number three is about uh, best resilience practices. So we will be giving you really hands-on uh, practice for resilience coming from four different cities, two Chinese cities, the city of uh, Chong, Chongxing, Dalian, and as well one city from Korea, Suwon City, and uh, one city from Japan, Matsuyama City. So without further ado, I would like to start this session and move to our first speakers. So for this presentation on resilient practice of Chongqing, I would like to invite Dr. Hua Feng Gong, uh, the Executive Dean, uh, Sustainability of Landscape uh, City Development Institute from Chong Chongqing City in China. So Dr. Uh, Kong graduated from University of Kentucky with a PhD in civil engineering degree and uh, applied statistic master degree. Dr. Kong is a registered U.S. professional engineer and a registered Chinese uh, professor level senior engineer. He is also a member of the, both the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Institute of Transportation Engineers as well. So he's currently the chief engineer of uh, TY uh, Lin International China Office and the executive dean of the SLDI. And with over 25 years of research and work experience in transportation sector, uh, Dr. Cohen is an expert in leading large sustainable transportation and green road projects. Uh, and he is strongly committed to work on reinforcing traffic safety and efficiency, reducing energy consumption and improving environmental quality uh, through project application. So once again, we would like to all welcome Dr. Hoffing Kong for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, okay, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me... Okay, can you hear me? Dr. Kong, we currently cannot hear you. Could you uh, maybe test out just unmuting and yourself? Can you hear me now? We still cannot hear you. Uh, we can hear, oh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me now? Right, everything is good, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. My apologies. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank SitchNet for this opportunity to present on resilience practice in Chongqing. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to mention that uh, I have just organized an international forum held in Chongqing uh, two months ago. The topic was uh, resilient cities. It was uh, quite a quite successful event with a total of more than uh, uh, 1,300 attendees presented and uh, uh, 1.2 million people watched online. Uh, so to so, uh, start by, So to start with this presentation, I'd like to uh, share some understanding of resilience. Oh, oops. Uh, the awareness of resilience was originated from fighting against the disasters. Natural disasters or human-made ones such as fires, 
earthquakes, diseases, those kind of disasters are happening everywhere globally and they are causing damages to our daily lives. So far, uh, as we know, 1.45 million lives have been lost during the COVID-19 pandemic this year. But um, uh, many studies have also proved that uh, almost 60% uh, to 70% of disasters, damages can actually be avoided with the proper proactive disaster risk management. Uh, when we look at disasters at a resilience perspective, uh, they can be classified into four types. The first one is the natural disasters like flood, hurricane. The second one is uh, human disasters like terrorism events, traffic accidents. The third one is secondary disasters uh, like uh, landslides and the fires after earthquake. The last one is uh, uh, chronic stresses as a result of urban development, such as uh, high unemployment, only high uh, housing prices and so on. Among those, uh, the among those, the chronic stress is most likely to be ignored, but it can cause a significant amount of long-term damage to people and the cities where people live in. Within the city, uh, actually, could be defined as the city with the capacities to absorb future shocks and stresses to its social, economic, technical systems and infrastructures. In uh, 2013, the Rockefeller Foundation supported 100 uh, resilient cities to help them build resilient strategies and the social framework. Uh, the second part of my presentation uh, is about the challenges that we face we face in, uh, in Chongqing. As we know, um, as a multi-large society uh, with a population of over 30 million, Chongqing is challenged by both natural disasters and the social issues. Currently, the, the prime six issues are flooding, landslide, soil erosion, traffic congestion, infection disease, and aging. In response to those challenges, we took a long view of resilience. We have determined the actionable goals to address those challenges. I will give four examples in the following slides. The first one is uh, flooding. This year, so we, uh, we were hit by the largest flood since 1998, which impacted more than 30% of the total air of China. This severe flood in Chongqing has uh, caused emergency evacuation of over 2.5 million people, leaving over 20,000 properties in damage. In damage. As you, uh, you can see, the left picture is the flood in uh, uh, heritage towns. Uh, if you uh, once visited Chongqing, you know uh, this is a famous uh, heritage town. Uh, in response to the flood disasters, Chongqing has arranged uh, an advanced allocations in disaster relief funds and it dispatched uh, 94,000 relief supplies, including sufficient uh, drinking water. Uh, convenience food to support the disaster areas. Also, uh, the professionals to conduct the troubleshooting for the infrastructure and the housing facilities in the affected uh, regions, discovering the additional 13,000 potential risk. The second uh, uh, example is the fight with the pandemic outbreak. Early this morning, so we were uh, hit by the biggest pandemic of uh, this centuries. 
Chongqing is geographically located next to Hubei province, uh, the center of outbreak for COVID-19 at the time in China. Although it put us in a great risk during the outbreak period, Chongqing has done a great job in preventing the transmission. With only 584 cases of infection and six cases of deaths confirmed by the end of March. As actually, this is much lower than the numbers predicted earlier of this year. Uh, there are the Chongqing countermeasures against the uh, COVID-19. Starting with the uh, transmission control by tracking and identify potential risks, minimize the number of trips and uh, keeping social distance. Secondly, we provided the timely and transparently case updates and reports using health code, sharing latest news and uh, holding regular press conferences. Thirdly, to diminish the effect of COVID-19 on everyday living, we implemented the online to offline service on a large scale combined with uh, virtual experience. Uh, lastly, encourage people to return back to work via measures like uh, online meetings, flexible uh, working hours, and uh, working from, uh, from home. The third problem is aging. Uh, according to the statistics in Chongqing, uh, almost one in four Chongqing citizens are aged over 60, uh, leading to a to, um, acute demographic crisis for our societies. So therefore, our local government must ensure that the social systems are ready to deal with this uh, problem. Uh, several actions uh, were taken in order to uh, ensure that seniors could feed the society and uh, be better off, which includes um, provi providing the continued education, good community service, affordable new housing, free legal consultants, and so on. All those actions were made to help building a resilient and inclusive community. The last problem is the availability of transportation in Chongqing. So from this slide, you can see the picture. Uh, we can see Chongqing is divided by mountains and the river and the rivers, so which makes the transportation infrastructure more vulnerable since the transportation systems heavily relies on cross river and the cross mountain corridors. To uh, achieve a safe, secure, efficient, and reliable transportation system, Chongqing has implemented several strategies. First is to increase authority gateways across the uh, rivers and the mountains. In Chongqing, there are two rivers and five mountains. Uh, secondly, to apply uh, stricter design standards for critical infrastructures. Actually, when we uh, design bridge or tunnels, uh, the government usually applies uh, strict, stricter design standards. Uh, certainly, uh, set up the maintenance and uh, monitor systems for those key locations using advanced equipment and, and the technology, uh, technologies. The last part I, I will talk about uh, our future plan and actions. Resilient city uh, is the newest concept for the city of Chongqing. Uh, even there are some, uh, even there were some practices in Chongqing. So those uh, practices were immature, immature and uh, fragmentary. Now that we are about uh, about to explore some systematic measures to make the city more resilience. Uh, that's all my presentations. Thank you uh, for listening. If you have 
have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kong. Uh, that was a really insightful presentation. I, I think I really like the fact that you brought maybe some of the main uh, key area where your city is facing challenges uh, and doing well actually in increasing your resilience. So namely uh, floods, COVID-19, aging and transportation. I think that's a lot of points that other cities in Northeast Asia and across Asia might uh, face similar challenges. And I think some of our participants might have learned from that. I think um, you're mentioning how this is a rather new concept that you are including within the city uh, recently. So we're talking about through planning, engineering, uh, the different standard and stakeholders. So I, I know you're saying it's rather recent, but could you maybe talk about what did your city so far has seen as, as a benefit of increasing the resilience for your city? Have you already seen some benefits that you can tell so that other cities are be oh for, for my city it's worth it to I should increase resilience right in those aspects. Uh, actually, I see some um, benefits. Uh, for example, uh, there are some bridges uh, uh, between the the uh, the group the the, uh, the group. Actually, in Chongqing, there are almost uh, um, there are almost uh, nine groups uh, uh, in these cities. Uh, from uh, one, one district to another district, actually there are some uh, bridges. Once, if there is any one bridge, when the traffic congested, so you actually you can't get get a chance to get another district. So the government uh, actually planned and constructed more bridges. So once this bridge is congested, then you can uh, choose another bridge to, to pass. Great, thank you. I think that's a, that's a really good answer. And I think that highlights how maybe uh, resolving some of the issue of resilience uh, end up solving some of the other issues that the city is facing as well, right? So again, it's this idea of not thinking about it as just uh, resilience, let's say for disaster, but how by doing those actions, it also increase, uh, it facilitate transportation, it can help your city develop in so many other ways. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Huafeng Kong from uh, Chongqing City. It's been really a pleasure. And we will be uh, moving on towards, with our session, towards the next uh, presentation. So uh, moving forward, the second presentation is going to be coming from uh, Talian City, as well in China, uh, which is going to be uh, hosted by, or presented by Dr. Chun, who obtained uh, a Doctor of Engineering degree in uh, Arbin Institute of Technology. He is also a professor level senior engineer and, and state registered urban and rural planner. He is currently working as the vice president of the Dalian Urban Planning and Design Institute. Dr. June's expertise is in the field of national land uh, sp uh, spatial planning, ecological restoration of national space, urban and rural transportation planning, and finally on, on municipal infrastructure planning. So we're all looking forward to hear a little bit more about the planning practices of urban disaster prevention and mitigation based on a resilient urban development. And uh, as Dr. Uh, Jaime Jun is going to be presenting in, in, uh, directly in Chinese, we will have uh, Mr. Kevin Zhang from Archie City that will assist with a consecutive interpretation. So first, uh, Dr. Jun is going to present in, in Chinese and uh, break it broken down in different parts. Uh, Mr. Chang is going to be doing the interpretation. So thank you, Dr. Jun. The floor is yours. Okay, can you start? Can you hear? Okay. 呃，感谢这个呃咱们主持人的介绍，也感谢咱们亚太城市发展研究组织的邀请。我很荣幸哈、啊，因为我是来自于。呃，这个中国城市规划行业的，就是刚才主持人也对我做了介绍，是规划设计院。实际上，这是我之前的一个呃任职的单位。那么现在单位的名字叫国土空间规划设计有限公司。当然，这个是呃适应我们国内这个城乡规划体制改革之后，这个把这个公司的名字做了
呃重新的修正，就原来那个单位已经不存在了哈。呃，那么我今天给大家呃各位同行做一个呃简要的汇报吧，因为我来自于城市规划领域，那么我所熟知的就是在规划的从规划的角度怎么看怎么认识这个呃韧性城市的发展。呃，当然，城市规划是城市建设呃比较这个前端的一件事情。那么，先要有个规划，才能去做这个实施。呃，所以当然就规划比比较重要。如果规划显得很周全，那么后期在我们城市发展过程当中，可能就会走很呃就会减少很多弯路啊，让城市发展的更加健康，更加这个有韧性。呃，那我大概先简要说一下大连的概况。那么大连市呢，这个地处我们呃东北亚地区。呃，是我们中国啊、呃、沿海最为开放的城市，也是中国的计划单列市。它东临渤海，西临黄海，呃，三面环海，呃，也是一座依港而建、因港而兴的城市。那么，中国也跟这个呃日本的、韩国呀，还有许多东南亚国家，因为今天好多代表来自于这几个这些国家，呃，有着良好的这种经济往来。那么，作为我们这个城市，它也把。建设东北亚重要的国际航运中心城市作为城市的发展目标。呃，那么从国内的大区位，我们位于啊、呃、辽东半岛的最南端，隔海对岸就是山东半岛。那么大连呢 ？Yes, my apologies. I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, it's just so that it facilitates the understanding of our audience. If if Mr. Kevin Chang could start some of the the trans the interpretation now. So we can break down the the presentation in, in smaller part, so it's a little bit easier to understand. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, yeah. Kevin. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. So, uh, for moderating this important milestone event organized by CityNet, and Mr. Jun Haiming, it's from Dalian Planning Institute, and uh, Jun Zhong, you can put the PPT in the first page. Thank you. 现在，喂，哎，俊总你好，把 PPT 我继续吗？哦不，您可以放在，呃，把 PPT 放在前两页，我我从头给您。好的，好的，明白了。Thank you. Well, Kevin, I'll just、uh, asking Mr. Jun to start over from the first page of the PowerPoint slides. Okay. So,、um, Mr. Jun is from the Planning Institute from Dalian. He's trying to、uh, introduce the geographic location for the city of Dalian as the coastal city and as a very important port area. Dalian is grow with the city from a port and grow with the port. Dalian is an important international air transport center, city center. So, uh, next one, please. Next one. 俊总，下一页。啊、uh, ，located in the south of、uh, Liao Tong Peninsula, Dalian facing Shandong Peninsula, northeast China and Inner Mongolia area. The air, land area under its jurisdiction spans over 13,700 square kilometers, which is the total population today at seven million. Thank you. 好的，呃，那么在韧性城市规划方面，应该说涉及的内容也非常多。呃，刚才也讲到，我们大连这个是一座呃改呃滨海海滨城市，所以呢，水对于大连来讲非常重要。呃，而且大连呢，在这个水资源方面还是一个一座缺水的城市，就是我们大连本地的水资源不是很为充分。呃，所以今天想借这个机会啊，就是向各位同行简单介绍一下我们在城市规划领域如何应对这个水资源不足，呃，如何做这个海绵城市建设方面。So water is an important factor for the city of Dalian. When talking about water, we have to talk about urban resiliency because it, it reflects the recovery and reaction level from urban infrastructure to cope with the disaster interventions. The Chinese government puts high emphasis on resilient city development in all phases of urban rural planning process. Resilient city is a very broad concept. So today we want to focus on the city of Dalian and to share some examples of Dalian resilient city best practice solutions to our guests. Thank you. Oh. 
呃，因为中国还是一个发展中的国家，那么大连呢，虽然是我们在呃东北地区是一个比较开放的城市，但是在城市建设领域还有很多很长的路要走，还有很多不成熟的地方。那么水资源呢，是我们大连市在城市发展当中非常重视的一件事情，因为我们水的供水能力并不足。那么在大概在两千年左右的时候，我们曾经出现过一次这个就是非常旱，那一年就是发生了旱灾。我们的水库水源严重不足，所以就体现了城市这种应对水资源能力不足方面，还有很多工作要做。那么围绕这个水资源，我们大概做了这么几方面的工作。第一个就是我们从开源的角度要增加水资源，呃，大概有这么几种途径。第一个，我们这个呃多途径的这个提呃提供这个水资源，比如说我们呃应用海水淡化技术开展这个海水的这个利用啊，我们已经。在我们的长海县啊，在我们的这个松木岛建了两座大型的海水淡化厂。那么同时呢，我们更多的这个污水回用用于这个生态系统的循环啊，这是第一种开源的办法。第二种就是我们挖掘本地的水库资源啊，我们把一些小的水库作为备用的应急水源，都把它呃系统的管理起来，来增加我们的这个水资源的总量。第三个呢，从长远发展看，我们还要有啊有一定的战略性。这个提高跨境供水的能力，也就是说，我们要跨境供跨境这个饮水，从其他省份这个水资源充沛的地区来调水，这样多渠道保证我们整个水源的总量，这是一种办法。Speaking of water resource, uh, since Dalian sometimes somehow from perspective is lack of the water. For example, in the year of 2000. There is a water shortage back in the time. So uh, all the works that we mentioned earlier focus on the water development, about water supply, and you can see the bullet point、uh, listed: in increased supply channel, incorporate local unconventional water sources to build new water storage, and to plan cross-border water from the international perspective. Thank you. 谢谢，啊，您可以继续。第二方面呢，就是我们要节约用水，从节流的角度啊，来减少水资源的这种耗用量。那么这个一个是我们从呃工业、农业等这种生产性用水这个角度，我们要这个建设引进这种节约性、节约用水的节这个对这个水资源耗用量比较小的这种工业，来这个降低水耗。呃，再一个就是从。呃，需求管理的角度，我们呃对这些个啊、呃、行业用水呀，我们做一些个节水规划，让他们有序用水，减少浪费，大概是这样一种节流的思思路。你比如说，我们呃要求这个嗯、呃、万元工业这个用水啊用水量，嗯、呃、在现在每万元产值十八立方米的这个基础上，要进一步降低。啊，我们的目标是未来降到八左右，也就是说，这样减少耗水。We've been discussing about supply. Now we're talking about conservations. So there's majorly two functions that are majorly actions that the government is implementing for water conservation. The first action is to build a water conserving society. Multiple action will be followed up by this. Priority and the second action is increase the supervision of the use of water resource. 好，郑总可以继续，谢谢。第三大块就是我们在天然水的利用方面，呃，我们想尽量这个把天然的雨水能够为我们所用，嗯、呃，所以我们围绕海绵城市做了大量的这个工作，呃，在呃近两年呢，我们。以这个我们所属的庄河地区为试点，呃，大概拿出二十几个平方公里的这个区域，总投总的投资已经超过了三十几个亿。我们在这个海绵城市建设方面，通过海绵海绵建设的手段，使这个天然的雨水，呃，这个能够呃被我们大量的收集下来，呃，这样的话呢，就是增加我们的水源储备，同时也改善了我们的这种城市环境。To give you an example of the Spang City development, we'd like to introduce the practice of Spang City in Zhuanghe City. So, for example, the government has in, in making in direct investment of about 3.2 billion RMB, 
and has achieved very positive result in disaster prevention and reduction, mainly through water conservation. Oh, Jinzo. 举几个简单的例子，第一个就是，这个在我们一些个呃，在这个是、呃、这个试点区域，呃，围绕一些个城市道路，我们建的这种新型的这个市政排水系统啊，就是在一些道路上，就是我下面这个图，一些个道路上，我们通过一些个绿植，通过一些渗水路面的建设，增加这种这个雨水的往地面的渗透啊，不让它这个直接的白白的流入到海里面去。再比如说，我们通过这种呃。防涝的这个排涝的蓄水蓄水水蓄水体系，然后增加这个对雨水的收集。那么这样做的好处就是，一方面呢，我们把雨水啊，这个地面径流系数变小嘛，把雨水都留在这个陆域。第二个又同时，因为这个庄河地区呢也临海，那么地面这个地地下水丰盈之后呢，又阻止了海水的入侵，同时也改善了陆地的这种简化的这种呃破坏，这是一种。We've been invented a innovative system called innovative public drainage system in the innovative district here in the city of Dalian. Our practice mainly focusing on the main road pipe network plus the branch road bioswale, as you shown earlier to the diagram on the left corner, the the branch road bioswale. And the pipe road network mainly collecting the rainwater and to sustain them as much as they, to the furthest extent at that small scale drainage and storage system can be functioning as a small scale seawater dam also to improve the solentized soil. Thank you, Jinzo. Um, continue. 再一种就是为了改善我们城市的内涝啊，我们建设这种，呃，多功能的行泻通道。呃，像左上图这个就是在人行步道下面，我们建设这种行洪通道啊。呃，然后呢，在其他地区，比如说这个，呃，有些个区域需要行洪排泄的，我们把这个路面呢给它进行铺装，铺装之后呢，其实增大了这种行泻的效果啊，行泻的效果。呃，这样就是通过这些个办法吧。So here's another example showing the large drainage system with multifunctional discharge channels. As a core, can effectively reduce the risk of water lodging. For example, we put in discharge tunnels in the renovation area. 还有一种就是我们做了这种呃岩石调蓄系统，实际上就是一个多级的多级的。沉积沉淀系统，就是由高到低，我们让这个水呀，在不同的这个高度进行这个静止。在静止期间呢，其实它就一些个呃污染物啊，就进行了沉淀。这样呢，呃，在我们水处理之后呢，就呃再排入海海里面或者是这个自然的呼吸里面之后啊，这个水就相对比较轻，比较轻，所以对水环境的改善非常有益。这种办法就是比较行之有效。We invented the third practice solution, which is the reconstruction of the multifunctional regulation and the storage system of the existing drainage ditches in the area of source transformation. Okay, continue. 一些个建设什么，这样我们对呃试点区域的岸线的恢复率达到了百分之六十以上，其中呢生态岸线率达到了百分之七十，那么在这试点区域形成的优良水域面积也超过了百分之十五，呃，所以说通过这种海绵城市的试点，呃，我们对整个区域的水环境，呃，这个改善极大。另外呢，对这个地下水的改善也非常好，增加了我们水源的这种呃呃调蓄能力。As you can see, the rate shown in the diagram it is the recovery rate at 60.7% and 70% of the ecological shoreline rate, which all shows that the innovative district has been showing great successful example. 那么这是实景前后的对比，改善前后的对比。呃，对内涝区域，对一些个，因为我们这个呃
，两面环海嘛，我们天然的河流非常多，对一些沟渠、河湖，就是这个水水水环境改善非常明显，呃，内涝的改善也非常明显。There's a picture showing on the before and after for the practice. 那俊总，那么大概还有一到两分钟时间，谢谢。好。那么围绕这个水水方面的自然灾害还有其他的，因为我们呃，所以滨海城市还有这个呃海洋风暴潮的这种影响。呃，这几年呢，这个每隔一两年总会有这种灾害的发生，所以我们对临海区域的建筑，我们一般都要做防暴的这个呃防风暴潮的这种专题认证。另外，沿海区域呢，我们从规划的角度要布局这种防护林带，它作为一种隔离，减少这种呃海潮，这个尤其这种冬季的风暴潮对我们城市的影响。呃，再比如说，我们沿海区域的这个城市开发建设，我们严格执行退退海岸线至少七十米之后才可以这个做这个城市建设。这样一方面呢，这个保护好的环境，其实也增加我们城市对呃这种自然灾害。As Tallinn is a coastal city, that we adhere to the concept of ecological friendly protection. For example, we prevent all the architecture to be implemented within the seventy meters of the seashore line. Thank you. Good. 那么同时，我们对城市区域的这个其他河流也进行严格的管控，呃，比如我们划定河道的蓝线，蓝线范围内我们是禁止，呃，与这个生态保护和水资源利用有关的这种任何开发建设。那么对，呃，河道沿线，我们呃，这个只能进行呃水生态恢复系统的这个建设，不能搞其他的。Here's a few example of showing up the urban drainage system for the flood control of the Spong cities. Another successful example. Thank you, Jindo. This is the middle of this image. This is our Dalian's Mara Ha. This is a very dry river. 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 So, after the water changes, the water is very clean. The river 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 is very clean. Nowadays, after the prevention of the pollutions, more and more local citizens have been jogging and doing exercise near the river. Thank you. 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 那么大连同时也是一个丘陵城市，我们也有地质地质灾害防治的问题。那么包括现在这个面对这个公共卫生事件，这次这个发生这个疫情公共卫生事件，应急交通以及突发事件情况下的我们这个城市物资供应链的这种规划，应该说这都是城市综合防灾体系规划的这个呃重要内容。Nowadays, it more and more important put emphasize on disaster prevention system development. So as you can show in on the diagram listed below. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 嗯，那么从规划的角度，我们呃，国家正在进行规划体制的改革，要建立新的国土空间规划体系。那么在新的国土空间规划体系构建的过程当中，应该是更加重视城市对这种自然灾害应对的能力，也就是城市韧性方面的考虑。呃，那么按照新的这个编制体系要求，我们要在啊，呃，气候、气象、城市公共安全和综合防灾等方面要做专题的研究和规划，这是我们传统规划呃相对来说呃这个嗯不是那么强化的地方。那么在新的这个规划体系里面，我们将对这些内容进行呃这个加大这个规划力度，进一步提升城市韧性。The urban planning system has been reformed since 2019 under the CPC central meetings of the reform committee. The previous planning is more talking about less than atmosphere, environment, and public safety perspective. Now the new reformed new urban planning system has been talking more about resilient cities and urban resiliencies. So this is a new positive and new realized policy that been 
if putting it into effect. I think that should be all. Yep. 谢谢崔总。呃，应该说，在这个韧性城市建设方面，我们大理石还有很长的路要走。呃，今天由于时间关系，只把我们，呃，有的仅有的一点这个经验，呃，介绍给各位同行。呃，希望大家能够呃有所收获。谢谢主持人，谢谢会议。Thank you so much for your time, and given the time constraint that we only show us a little about Dalian, but going forward in the future, we hope to show you more about the recent practice from the city. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, so, so much, Dr. Jun. I think it's it's been really a pleasure, and I, I've got to say that I'm quite impressed with uh, the way Talian has been uh, tackling urban resilience, and especially in terms of water shortage. I, I think a lot of cities are facing the same challenges, especially uh, the way you tackled it through water access, but also the other side, the water conservation, and especially the context or the example of this punch city development. I think is really good. We're a little bit short on time, but I want to ask you one question. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Sponge City development and all the different innovative, all the different innovative uh, practices were actually um, a pilot for the city. So I want to just, if you can briefly just mention, is there a possibility for scalability? Are you going to reach uh, other part of the city, or is there other city in China or abroad that were interested in in implementing this Sponge City practice? Thank you. 非常感谢俊总今天精彩的分享。我们对大连的韧性城市建设，然后得到了很多的启发，然后对您的这个取得的成绩感到非常的高兴。然后同时呢，俊总也今天呃，主持人对您有一个呃，由于时间原因，这边有一个问题想跟您交流一下。那么就是刚才您提到的，呃，大连市的海绵的城市的这个这个韧性城市的试点工作。那么，请问他的问题就是，那么对这个试点工作的规模有没有一定的这个要求？那么他一定是要复制这个成功的规模在其他的地区以及其他的城市吗？那么他，请您围绕着这个，大概这个试点以及他的更接下来的进一步的这个呃工作的这个愿景进行一个探讨，谢谢。好的，嗯、呃，谢谢这个主持人。呃，我们是这样，因为呃这几年我们在呃大众城市这个应对自然灾害过程当中，暴露出很多城市在防灾减灾方面的一些个不足吧。呃，尤其是在这个水灾应对水灾，刚才重庆那位专家也讲到，就是我们有很多气候性的灾害。那么这里面对这个暴雨灾害，我们应该是比较比较多的。呃，所以我们对海绵城市的建设，我们国家非常重视。呃，已经先后推出了两批这个试点。我们大连的庄河地区是第二批全国的这个，呃呃，这个海绵城市建设的试点。实际上，我们中国的城市建设一直在践行着这个海绵城市建设的一些基本要求，只是说我们现在这个在过去走的过程当中还不那么系统。呃，在这个两轮试点之后。我们成功的总结了很多经验，经验之后应该是在全国进行比较广泛的推广。你比如说，我们庄河市除了这次二十二平方公里的试点之后，那我们就要总结经验教训，在接下来的这个整个庄河市区的城市建设，以及我们大连的城市建设，大连全市的这个这个城市建设当中，都会呃积极的推广呃这里面的一些成功经验。你比如说，这里面对于透水路面的这个。呃，建设，呃，这呃之前呢，这个我们在一些城市建设这个这个环节也一直在这么做，但是呢，通过这些个呃试点城市的这种呃这两年的这种这种试点，我们应该说进一步提高了这种呃呃这些里面的这些个技术性的这个手段和方法啊、呃，尤其是它这里面关于一些个水水水这个解决地面径流的这种手段，呃，都是比较呃有价值的这种。所以会在我们国内的很多城市得到进一步的广泛推广。那主持人，我大概回答这些。谢谢军总 ，Thank you. Um, so Kevin, I will briefly uh introduce uh the main idea. So first of all, uh, he was saying that uh Mr. Jun was saying that there's exactly as we mentioned, there's two years of uh pilot projects. It's actually been two phases. For the pilot projects, so after the two pilot project phases, the city of Dalian has experienced some technical experience and want to implement 
and to, uh, to share this best practice solutions to other cities and to other regions, especially in the field of rainstorm. So basically, I think this is going to continue the pilot project and have this kind of the multiple effect to other cities. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Heining Tune. It was really a pleasure and it's great to see so many innovation and I hope that uh, other participants who are interested in those practice and, and would like to learn more about it will contact us uh, so we can put them in, in touch with you to learn more about it. Uh, so moving forward for the next presentation, we will uh, change country now and we will see a best practice, a case coming from the city of Suwon in Korea. For this presentation, I will invite Dr. Kim Kim Eun-young, is, uh, which is a research fellow in the Department of Urban Planning and Design Research for the Suwon Research Institute, uh, which was established in March, March 2013 by the basic local government for the first time. And it is a think tank uh, founded uh, for the will of the citizen of the city of Suwon. It aims to lead Suwon City to move to become an advanced, global, and future-oriented uh, city. And previous to this current workplace, uh, she was a researcher at the Korea Adaptation, Adaptation Center for Climate Change and the National Environment Information Network System. Uh, Kim Yun Young received a PhD in landscape uh, architecture at Seoul National University. And uh, Mr. Mrs. Dambi Liu from the Assistant Secretary will be assisting again with a consecutive interpretation. Uh, thank you very much. Mrs. Kim, yeah. thank you. the floor is Uh, 안녕하세요. 수원시정연구원의 김은영입니다. 저, 어, 시티넷 웨비나를 통해서 수원시 도시 회복력 현황과 어, 회복력을 높이기 위한 사례를 소개할 수 있어서 영광이라고 생각하고 있습니다. Hello, I'm Eunyoung Kim from Suwon Research Institute. It is an honor to introduce a case representing the effort to improve the urban resilience of Suwon and its current situation through the CityNet webinar. Uh, Suonshin,呃,都市的70%以上的개발된都市啊,가많이진행된都市입니다.현재수원시는都市개발과인구증가로수,都市의불투수포장비율이계속지속적으로증가하고있는,있습니다.증가하고있습니다.토지피복의변
장기적으로는 회복록에 필요한 시간과 비용을 절감될 것이라고 저희는 생각하고 있습니다. I think those participating today are interested in urban resilience. There may be a variety of social, economic, and environmental methods to boost the city's resilience. But in this presentation, I would like to talk about ways to enhance the city's resilience in terms of environment. You must have seen this picture at least once. Among the different aspects of resilience, if we specifically look at the resilience of urban ecosystem health, there are many varied attempts made to enhance urban ecosystem health. These results are temporary and can be easily disrupted by physical, biological, and social barriers. This is because it has low resilience. Therefore, in order to improve the health of urban ecosystem, to overcome the barriers. This will save time and money for the recovery. 수원시는 도시회복력의 현재 상태를 평가하기 위해서 기존에 연구되었던 사례를 토대로 지표를 선정하고 이를 적용한 결과입니다. 어, 앞서서 충칭시에서도 그 도시회복력과 관련된 지표를 말씀해 주셨는데요. 사실 크게 다르진 않습니다. 어, 수원시의 미래 기후는 폭염이나 폭우, 가뭄 등의 영향에 대한 회복력을 높이기 위해서 사회적, 사회적 회복력, 경제적 회복력, 도시 인프라, 그리고 생태적인 회복력이 모두 높아져야 합니다. 대표적인 지표로 말씀드리면 사회적, 어, 사회적 회복력 지표로는 취약계층의 관리, 경제적 회복력에는 취업률, 어, 경제적 다양성, 그리고 도시 인프라 측면에서는 노후주택이나 하수 관거의 용량이 중요한 그런 회복력을 높이기 위한 중요한 지표라고 볼수 있습니다. 또한 생태적 회복력을 높이기 위해서는 불투수 포장 비율이라든지 녹지 비율이 얼만큼 있는지가 중요한 지표로 볼수 있습니다. 수원시는 오랜 역사를 가진 도시로 노후된 지역이 많이 남아 있습니다. 도시 회복력을 높이기 위해서 다양한 시도가 필요한 시점이라고 볼수 있습니다. This is the result of selecting and applying indicators based on previously studied cases to evaluate the current status of urban resilience in Suwon. In order to enhance resilience to the effects of heat waves, heavy rains, and droughts of the future climate of Suwon, social resilience, economic resilience, urban infrastructure, and ecological resilience should be high. To explain the typical indicators, the social resilience indicator is management of the vulnerable population. The economic resilience indicators are employment rate, and economic diversity. And the urban infrastructure resilience indicators are old housing, sewage treatment, and, e and the ecological resilience indicator is the green area ratio. Suwon City is a city with a long history, and there are still many old areas left. It's time to make various efforts to improve resilience. 다음은 수원시가 도시 회복력을 높이기 위해서 근본적인 노력을 하고 있는 부분입니다. 근본적으로 그린 인프라 확보를 위해서 이를 연결할 수 있는 기반을 마련하는 데 노력을 하고 있습니다. 공원과 가로수를 조성해서 양적인 측면에서 녹, 양적인 증가뿐만 아니라 녹지축, 활력도 등의 녹지의 질적인 향상을 위해서도 노력하고 있습니다. 특히 시민 참여를 통해서 도시숲 조성이 수원시의 주요 조성 사업이 수원시의 중요한 정책이라고 할수 있습니다. In order to enhance its resilience, Suwon City is striving to secure fundamental green infrastructure and lay the foundation to connect it to the city. Suwon is striving not only to increase the quantity of parks and street trees, but also to improve the quality and vitality of green areas. In particular, the Green Forest Creation Project through citizen participation can be said to be the main policy of Suwon City. Suwon City is a high density of water supply, which is one of the main issues of water supply in the city. To increase the water supply, we have to build a water supply tank, and to use the water supply, we have to 
여름철 뜨거, 뜨겁게 달궈진 도로의 온도를 낮추는 데 사용하기도 합니다. 또한 LID 기법을 이용해서 비점오염을 오염물질을 저감하고 우수 유출을 줄이기 위해서 노력하고 있습니다. 또한 지속적인 모니터링을 통해서 그 효과를 검증하기 위한 연구도 하고 이러한 모니터링 결과를 사업의 타당성 뿐만 아니라 시민들에게 도시 회복력을 높이는, 알리는 데 활용할 예정입니다. Since Swan City has a high rate of impervious pavement, it has made urban water circulation an important policy goal. A rainwater storage tank was created not only to increase the usage rate of rainwater, but also to lower the temperature of hot roads in the summer. Swan is trying to reduce non-point pollutants and rainwater runoff using LID facilities. We are verifying its effectiveness through continuous monitoring. These monitoring results will be used to inform citizens of the city's resilience as well as the feasibility of the project. 작년 2019년에 수원시는 환경부에서 지원하는 도시 생태계 건강성 증진 사업을 위한 R&D 사업에 테스트 배드로 선정되었습니다. 이번 R&D 사업에서는 도시 회복력을 높이는 차원에서 벽면 녹화, 인공 세집, LID 모듈 등을 개발할 예정입니다. 특히 리빙랩을 통해서 시민의 참여를 독려할 계획도 있습니다. 본 사업을 통해서 회복력 기술이 개발되고 수원시에서 이를 적용해서 그 효과를 알리는 데 노력하고 있습니다. 어, 이것으로 제가 오늘 회복력 사례를 모두 마치겠는데요. 이번 사례 공유를 통해서 수원시뿐만 아니라 다른 도시에서 다른 도시들과 함께 성장하는 계기가 되길 바라겠습니다. 감사합니다. In 2019, Suwon was selected as the test bed for the R&D project supported by the Ministry of Environment to promote urban ecosystem health. In this R&D project, we plan to develop wall greening, artificial birdhouses, and LID modules to enhance the city's resilience. In particular, we plan to encourage citizens to participate through the Living Lab. Through this project, we are working hard to develop resilience technology and promote its effectiveness by applying it to Suwon City. This concludes the presentation of the case of urban resilience in Suwon City. I hope sharing this case will provide an opportunity for Suwon City to grow with other cities. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Kim Hyun Young. It was a pleasure to hear uh, a little bit more about the resilience uh, plans and, and projects and policies in Suwon. I, I think we will just go through one question, perhaps before moving on to our next presentation. So we, you did mention that the main policy of Suwon City is to create a uh, urban forest through citizen participation. Could you explain maybe a little bit more about this policy? Thank you. 현재 그 수원 시장님의 공약 중에 하나가 6분 거리 시민의 숲 조성 사업이라고 있습니다. 공원 녹지가 부족한 아까 공원 녹지가 부족한 도시 노후된 지역에서 시민들이 직접 자투리 공간을 발굴하고 수원시가 이를 지원해서 공원 녹지를 만드는 그런 사업이 있었습니다. 또한 마을 정원 사업을 통해서 재료비를 재료 제공하고 시민이 직접 녹지를 조성하는 그런 사례도 있었고 이거를 연말에 시상을 해서 시민들과 함께 그 즐길 수 있는 시간들도 같이 공유할 수 있었습니다. Among the pledges made by the mayor of Suwon, there was a project named creating a citizens forest within six minutes distance. It is a project in which local residents discovered spare space in areas where there is a shortage of park and open spaces and Suwon City promote, supported it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Eun-young Kim from uh, Suwon City. It is a pleasure again to receive your presentation today. I hope uh, that we can put you per perhaps in touch if some of our uh, participants and the other government officials from different cities are interested into implementing some of Suwon's innovative practices. Now moving forward for our last presentation of this session, um, I would like to uh, introduce from the city of Matsuyama, 
Mr. Daisuke Shiba, uh, who is a uh, multiple thing. It's first of all, he, a firefighter, but that is now dispatched to the City Hall uh, Crisis Management Division to oversee uh, the DR education program. He is actively engaging with the stakeholders in the city to conduct the disaster education program. In the meantime, cooperating with other stakeholders as well on the promotion of the concept, uh, both domestically and internationally. And I would like to add that Mr. Kendra Irata from the CityNet Yokohama project office will assist with a consecutive interpretation. So Mr. Daisuke Shiba, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Daisuke Shiba from Matsuyama City. Today, I'd like to introduce the effort that Matsuyama City is making to enhance its regional disaster prevention capabilities. I would like to present in Japanese and ask Mr. Kendra Hirata to translate. Nihon wa kako ni nando mo dai saigai ni ai. Saikin no dai jishin dake demo hanshin awaji dai shin sai. Niigata ken shuetsu jishin. Higashi nihon dai shin sai. Kumamoto jishin nado kazoe kire masen. Can you hear me now? Japan has yes, yes, please go ahead. Thank okay. you, Kendra. Japan has suffered many major earthquakes in the past. Recent major earthquakes include the Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake, or better known as the Kobe earthquake, the Niigata Chuichu earthquake, the Great East Japan earthquake, and the Kumamoto earthquake. The greater the damage caused by a disaster, the harder it is for us, the fire department, the police, etc., to rescue or help everyone. Almost 90% or more of the people who were saved in such a situation are helped by people around them and people in the community.日本で初めて資格取得に必要な費用全額を公費で負担し地域住民をはじめ小学校中学校の先生や民間企業など様々な職域の市民に資格を取ってもらい防災の専門家を幅広く育成することで自分たちの命は自分たちで守る地域のこと
毎年研修会や講演会で知識の維持向上やスキルアップをしています。In Matsuyama, as a part of continuing education to maintain and improve knowledge as well as skills, we hold workshops and lectures every year for those who have become b o s a i s h i 防災に関して女性の存在はすごく大切なので女性防災士を対象に毎年交流会や意見交換会などのイベントを開催して良好な関係づくりにも取り組んでいます。Regarding disaster prevention, the existence of and involvement of women is very important. So we hold social exchange meetings for female 防災士 every year to foster good relationships. また防災には企業の協力が欠かせません。そこで民間企業で防災士を育成した事業所には、日本で松山,松山市だけの防災協力事業所に認定し、市内企業が積極的に地域防災に協力できる体制を整えています。現在、市内300以上の事業所が認定されています。In addition, private sector cooperation is indispensable for disaster prevention. Therefore, we have established a system in which companies in the city can actively cooperate in regional disaster prevention by training their employees and being certified as disaster prevention cooperation establishments for their proactive role. This is our original certification system and the only one in Japan. Currently, more than 300 business establishments in the city have already been certified. So, two years ago, 西日本豪雨では全国で200名以上の尊い命が失われました。松山市でも甚大な被害があり、4名の人の命が失われています。Two years ago, during the heavy rains in Western Japan in July, more than 200 precious lives were lost nationwide. The city of Matsuyama also suffered great damage where four people lost their lives. その中でも松山市の高浜地区はこのような土砂災害が30カ所以上発生しました。During that disaster, more than 30 such sediment related disasters occurred in the Takahama district of Matsuyama city. これは松山市の海の玄関、松山観光港の近くの山の様子ですが、最大1キロメートル以上に及ぶ大規模な土砂災害が多くの住宅を押しつぶしました。This is the state of the mountain near Matsuyama tourist port, the entrance to the sea in Matsuyama city, where you can see a large scale landslide disaster of up to one kilometer or more, which buried many houses. そんな中、高浜地区では、地域の防災士を中心に、自分たちで地域内の危険を確認し、市の避難勧告を待たずして、一軒一軒の住宅に声をかけて、早期の避難を促しましたその結果一人の犠牲者も出さず地域住民全員が生き延びたのですこれは地域住民が日頃から防災訓練や勉強会を開催して地域コミュニティが高まり地域全員の力でみんなの命を守ったもので松山市が目指してきた地域を守る人材育成が実を結んだ好事例でもありますこの功績に対し2019年には国土交通大臣表彰と内閣総理大臣表彰を受賞しました。In this disaster in Takahama area, 防災士 checked for the risks in the area by themselves and went house to house to warn the residents. They did not wait for the city's evacuation advisory to evacuate early. With this timely preemptive evacuation, all the local residents survived with zero casualty. This is because local residents held disaster prevention drills and study sessions on a daily basis as a local community grew, and everyone was empowered to protect each other's lives. This human resources development has been highly successful for Matsuyama City. For this achievement, we received the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism Award, as well as the Prime Minister's Award in 2019 from the Government of Japan. また地元愛媛大学と連携して大学生に防災士の資格を取ってもらい学生防災リーダーを育成しています就職後も即戦力の防災リーダーとして活躍していく取り組みを2015年から開始しこれまでに1000名を超える大学生が防災士になっています In addition, 
in collaboration with Ehime University, also located in Matsuyama University. Uh, students have qualified as Bosaishi as they are being trained as disaster prevention leaders. In 2015, we started efforts to play an active role as a disaster prevention leader who is ready to work even after getting a job. And so far, more than 1,000 university students have become Bosaishi. Bosaishi to not the University students who became Bosaishi participated in various community activities as seen here and participated in volunteering and research activities in the disaster area. 小学校の授業の先生になり、小学生に防災教育を行うなど、地域の人たちと関わりながら防災リーダーとしてのスキルを高めています。Currently, we are improving their skills to become disaster prevention leaders by making them interact with local people and holding classes in elementary schools. こうした取り組みを背景に、昨年からすべての世代への防災教育で、小学生から高齢者に至るまで。キレメナック防災リーダーを育成する取り組みに着手しました。松山市と愛媛大学、東京大学との連携協定を軸に、市内の大学や高校、商工会議所の企業や防災士などが一つとなって、日本初の全世代防災教育に取り組んでいます。From last year, we are putting emphasis on seamlessly developing disaster prevention leaders, starting from elementary school to the elderly through disaster prevention education for all generations. Based on the agreement between Matsuyama City, Ehime University, and the University of Tokyo, universities and high schools in the city, companies of the Chamber of Commerce and the Bosaishi, etc., we are working together to develop Japan's first all-generation disaster prevention education. Therefore, we have set up the Matsuyama Bosai Leaders Training Center at Ehime University and are working with the university for further development. Homepage and YouTube channel are also set up we have also set up a homepage and a YouTube channel to provide information on various disaster prevention education. この全世代防災教育は小学生から始まる教育課程で継続的に防災教育を実践していくもので、学生生活を卒業するまでにすべての人が this disaster prevention education for all generations is to continuously practice disaster prevention education in the curriculum, starting from elementary school. We are aiming for all the students in Matsuyama to acquire a certain level of disaster prevention knowledge by the time they complete their studies. また小学生、中学生、高校生で特に防災に関心を持って。in addition, elementary school students, junior high school students, and high school students who are particularly interested in disaster prevention and are motivated to engage in disaster prevention activities have formed the Junior Disaster Prevention Leaders Club. This year, more than 300 students are in the process of developing junior leaders through various activities throughout the year. This way, from an early age, we are supporting the development of human resources who love the region and wishes to protect the region while gaining disaster prevention knowledge specific to the region by interacting with high school students, university students, and the elderly in the region. ここからは活動事例の紹介をします。まずは小学校での避難所運営ゲームの様子です。この授業で小学生たちは災害時に避難所で起こる困難な言葉らへの対応や 
高齢者、障害者、外国人など、配慮の必要な人への対応の必要性を学びます。Here are some activity examples. First, this is an evacuation center management game conducted at elementary school. In this class, students learn how to deal with the challenges that occur in the evacuation centers in the event of a disaster and learn how to deal with people who need support, such as the elderly、uh, and people with disabilities and foreigners. これは松山東高校という市内有数の進学校での防災の授業の様子です。1年を通して防災の知識と実践力を学んでいます。This is a disaster prevention class at Matsuyama Higashi High School, one of the city's leading advanced schools. Throughout the year, they are learning disaster prevention knowledge and practical skills. これは女子大学生の防災リーダーたちが地震発生を想定して自分たちの学校の体育館で避難所運営訓練をした様子です。高校生が避難者役として参加し、盲導犬や外国人の対応も学びました。This is how the disaster prevention leaders of a women's university conducted evacuation shelter, shelter management training at the gymnasium of their campus, simulating an earthquake. High school students also participated as evacuees and learned how to deal with the guide dogs and foreigners. これは熊本地震の被災地を訪問し、現地調査やボランティア活動を行った様子と、東日本大震災の被災地での現地調査。仙台市の大学生との交流の様子です。被災地を訪れることは何よりも身になることが多くなります。This is a scene of visiting the area affected by the Kumamoto earthquake and conducting field surveys and volunteer activities. A field survey of the area affected by the Great East Japan earthquake and interaction with university students in Sendai City. Actual visits to the disaster area like this is the best way to learn about disasters. これは松山市を訪れる外国人との防災交流の様子です。松山市にはたくさんの在住外国人や留学生、観光客がいます。その方たちの安全を守るため、防災教育の交流もしています。写真はネパール六市町の市長副市長との防災シンポジウム、ドイツの高校生との防災授業、韓国や中国、タイ、ベトナムなどの在住外国人への日本語防災講座の様子です。それぞれ大学生や高校生が先生役として指導しています。This is a disaster prevention exchange with foreigners visiting Matsuyama City. There are many foreign residents, international students, and tourists in Matsuyama City. In order to protect their safety, we also conduct disaster prevention education with them. The photo shows a disaster prevention symposium with the deputy mayors of six cities and towns in Nepal. A disaster prevention class with high school students from Germany and a Japanese language class and a disaster prevention course for foreign, foreign residents from Korea, China, Thailand, Vietnam, etc. Here, highly trained university students and high school students act as instructors. 最後にここでは紹介できませんでしたが、道路や河川の整備、山間部の対策工事など、ハード面の防災対策もしっかりと進めています。それに合わせて、ただいまご紹介したような日本でも先駆けの人材育成を進め、安全安心なまちづくりに取り組んでいます。私たちは全世界で災害からの犠牲者がゼロになるよう願っています。松山市の取り組みがシティネットを通じて、少しでも皆さんの参考になれば幸いです。共に手を取り合い、災害に強いパートナーシップを築いていきましょう。以上で私のプレゼンテーションを終わります。Thank you very much. Finally, although I couldn't explain in, in depth today, I would like to state that we are also promoting infrastructure disaster prevention measures such as road and river maintenance and applying countermeasures in the mountainous areas. In line with this, we are promoting the development of a pioneering human resources in Japan, as just introduced, and we are working to create a safer, secure city. We hope that someday there will be zero casualties from disasters around the world. We hope that Matsuyama City's effort will be of some help to overcome、uh, CityNet members. Let's work together to build a disaster resilient partnership. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Daisuke Shiba from Matsuyama City, for this、uh, 
extremely thorough presentation. I, I think I, I know you mentioned at the end uh, that you're talk there's a lot of measures that are being implemented for infrastructure, but I think it was extremely interesting to get to hear uh, an aspect that we maybe didn't talk as much today about education, right? So resilience is, is not just through infrastructure, but it is also through training. Uh, it goes through capacity building. And I think what was most interesting is how much you include your citizen and your resident into this resilience approach. And it really creates this trickle down effect where uh, informed and, and knowledgeable citizen and resident can also um, train and also share this knowledge with other citizens and, and it really does some of the work for you. Uh, and I think in this aspect, especially uh, towards students, that your presentation was quite complete. I think not many questions on this part, but I might raise one point that I think uh, you might be interested in sharing more about was this innovative program for businesses that you mentioned. Uh, you're the only city in Japan that has this, this certification for businesses. And I think that's also important to include both the public sector, the resident, but also the private sector, the businesses. So could you maybe explain a little bit how you convince uh, private sector to, to take part in this certification system? How can you convince them to want to conduct those trainings? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. えっと、で、え、一つだけご質問があるんですが、え、あの、え、ま、説得してこういう事業に参加してもらうようにされてますか。はい。え、防災士を取るというのは、ま、資格を取るだけなんですけども、松山市では、え、実はある一定の企業は我々がスタートするのと Okay. Uh, this uh, Bosaishi is a certification that uh, we started with uh, the residents, uh, but at the same time, uh, some of the businesses uh, in Matsuyama City also started similar kind of certifications. So, in that case, ま、step up semester. Okay. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had our own program uh, to make citizens uh, as a bosashi, and some of the uh, businesses started their own programs uh, around the same time. Uh, so what we did was uh, we uh, told the businesses who had already started such programs that we would cover their expenses uh, for training their employees or training uh, uh, anyone who they uh, wish to have this uh, certification. So uh, by doing that, uh, the businesses agreed to partner with us uh, so that you know their costs are all covered uh, and uh, at the same time, their uh, employees and uh, people would also uh, be trained. So in that case, Matsuyama市内, 
防災の重要性に気づいてそうしたあ防災し防災士を事業所で取ろうという、えー、機運が高まって今現在たくさんの事業所が300を超える事業所が防災士を取って松山市に協力してくれています。So as a result,、uh, many businesses、uh, got interested in this program、uh, because their funds were being covered. And、uh, at this point, we have more than 300、uh, plus、uh, businesses who are uh, working uh, under this program to get certifications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think it's really impressive that you've managed to really mobilize、uh, such a big part really of the private sector within your city. And combined with, with the enthusiasm that it seems comes from the, the citizen and the resident, I, I think it's really impressive. And I hope some of our participants from various cities are going to be able to learn from this experience. So, thank you again so much, Mr. Daisuke Shiba. It was really a pleasure for Matsuyama City to, to get to have your presentation today.、Uh, looking at the time, we're running a little bit short, so I will conclude. This is the last presentation that we had in this session for today. So, I'd like to thank again everyone. And if you allow me, I will just have some、uh, concluding words. So, again, so this, I, I want to mention or emphasize that this,、uh, this series of webinars on、uh, urban, urban resilience best practices from Northeast Asian cities is a partnership between CityNet,、uh, WRI China, and a r k e y City.、Uh, And for participants, I think it's, it was a great opportunity as well to connect with, with、uh, government officials from cities in Northeast Asia that were not necessarily already members from CityNet. So I really want to encourage you to visit our website,、uh, citynet-ap.org,、uh, and really to, to get to know us more and, and see how we can help you and, and join us so maybe your city can benefit from some of the service that we offer. And again, this is some of the, how we can contribute to the sustainable development from your city and to the increase of resilience in your city.、Um, finally, I, I'd like,、uh, as we're concluding, really, this, sec this session number three on best practices,、uh, we really got a, an overall view, I, I think, of what resilience is in Northeast Asia, with、uh, a first a presentation that went a little bit more、uh, on. From、uh, Chongqing City, which covered the flood, COVID 19, aging, and transportation. As well, then we got a little bit more infrastructure related presentation with Dalian City. We talked about water management and conservation and、uh, flooding as well. Then Suwon City from Korea went a little bit more、uh, in a citizen driven aspect to resilience、uh, and especially how to include citizens' opinion in, in, in the, the policy development process. For green infrastructure. And finally, we, we、uh, conclude this with a presentation from Matsuyama City on、uh, resident training and education for training and community building、uh, for disaster risk reduction and, and for resilience. So, once again, I would like to、uh, thank all of the speakers that presented in this session number three. So, Dr. Hua Feng Kong from、uh, Chongqing City, Dr. Hai Min Jun from、uh, Dalian, Dr. Kim. Yong from Suwon City and Mr. Daisuke Shiba from Matsuyama City. And、uh, please submit your feedback form、uh, after this, this webinar. Those comments are helping us to improve and really tackle and create content for your needs. And、um, we appreciate your interest in joining us this time. We look forward to seeing you in our future activities. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Have a good evening. <laughs>